So thank you, Robbie, and um, thank you for coming tonight to, to listen. I'll talk for about 40 minutes on these two problems, and I see them very much as the two great oversights of our times. I think they're interesting in that they have similar solution technologies. As I go through the talk, I'll try and persuade you that we can use the word survival technologies um, in terms of heading off the worst effects of these two phenomena, but they're very different in one way. Um, I'll be telling you two stories tonight, basically, um, and with due apologies to the people who've heard other presentations on peak oil from uh, people like Colin Campbell. I'm sure there are people here who haven't. Um, the climate change story in the world generally now is assuming the proportions of a flat earth versus round earth um, scenario. The preponderant view, the vast preponderant view is that we, we have a big problem with our emissions of greenhouse gases, most of which come from fossil fuel burning. The number one source of the number one gas carbon dioxide is of course oil burning, but gas and coal come close behind. And that's the heart of the problem. And pretty much outside of a diminishing sector of contrarians, often visibly and demonstrably funded by uh, companies like ExxonMobil, uh, plus the White House, the view is that we have a problem, we've got to deal with it, and as I'll show you if you're new to the issue, uh, we are in the process of dealing with it in um, interesting uh, ways. The big oil story is different. It's still a minority view. It's a fast-growing minority view. It's a view that's gone from what um, some people rather unkindly called a few years ago a hobbyist issue, big insults to uh, Colin Campbell, one of the, one of the father figures of this story, um, to a, actually a discussion that merits the front page space on the Wall Street Journal, which is what's happened this year. But it's still very much a minority view, and I'll be telling you that story. You should be aware, and I'm not in any way going to pretend that it's a majority view indeed, as I tell this story. And when I go into the oil industry, for which I used to work, I make this very clear. I hope there's a flaw in the argument. I genuinely hope there's a flaw in the argument. I haven't been able to see it yet, but um, uh, we, we have to hope that it's not quite as bad as many of us now suspect. Anyway, so the two meet, and the question is, how do they meet? And that all has to do with the arithmetic of carbon, how much carbon we can afford, in inverted commas, to burn in this great game of roulette we're playing with our climate. Um, and how much there is in remaining oil, oil, coal, and gas reserves. And that's what I'll get to at the end of the talk. So let's start with climate change, global warming, the inappropriate name of global warming. Uh, increasingly, we think of this as climate chaos or climate meltdown, as, as people call it. Uh, and in The Carbon War, the book that I wrote on the years that I saw between 1989 and 1997, the year that the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated, all those years of negotiation for my sins, I saw um, in the front lines actually at the UN negotiations that were kicked off with the World Climate Conference of 1990. I describe all that in the Carbon War. And along the way, um, I summarize the reasons why I think we should be really worried about this problem. There are 13 of them. Um, and here are the first 12 listed. The degree of the warming. Um, there's a very clear consensus view that an increase in the global average temperature, surface temperature, of two degrees Celsius is something we don't want to go beyond. And ever since um, 1996, the European Union has been negotiating based on that target. Uh, and we will be hearing more about that as I, as I go through. On current trajectories, we're headed for way beyond two degrees Celsius, I'm afraid to say. The rate of the warming, if you look at historical rates of warming and indeed historical rates of temperature change in the past, uh, th this is something that we need to worry about um, greatly. Biodiversity ecosystems don't adapt quickly and well to rates of warming of the rapidity with which we're in danger of locking into the system. Already we're losing biodiversity fast, and we have to worry about that uh, because it interacts with our 
uh, ability to feed ourselves in any number of ways. Sea level rise, this is perhaps as we look at the events of the last year, 2006 has been the year where it's become impossible, pretty much impossible, to avoid the conclusion that we have a big problem. Uh, the scientists are getting more and more shrill in this, and every government lab where this is studied now, I mean every one, some of the contrarians require us to believe this is all a vast conspiracy, of course, but NASA, NCAR, NOAA in the States, the Lawrence Livermore Lab, the Met Office in the UK, CSIRO in Australia, Max Planck Institute, all of them are now involved in this big body, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that studies the issue. Uh, they had their latest fourth report published in Paris on the 2nd of February, um, and I know lots of people in this process, and the though they speak in coded language. Uh, for those of you who've read the executive summary of that report, it's very easy to read between the lines the spirit that exists behind the scenes, and it is, there's a whiff of panic in the air now. They're very, very worried with what they're finding, and sea level rise is a good example, because um, of the three, I think, for those of you new to the problem, if I have to pick three issues that have crystallized in the last year, they'd be as follows. The first one, involves change thinking about the Greenland ice sheet. Now, the Greenland ice sheet, it had been assumed, would melt very, very slowly over many hundreds of years. Uh, and what the scientists in the early threat assessments had left out of the equation were these great cracks at the back of the ice sheet, where we now know and have discovered um, there are waterfalls of meltwater flowing down those cracks. They're going right to the base of the glacier of the ice sheet, and this thing, if it slips off Greenland in its entirety, will elevate global sea level by seven meters. Now, um, already this last year, the, from satellites, they've been doing gravity studies of the, of the ice sheet and found that the rate of spalling off on the edge of the ice sheet is increasing. The flow rates of two major glaciers are increasing. There are real things to be worried about here. Uh, the global economy essentially exists on the coastal plain. So we're talking about potentially, if we go above that two degrees, that's one of the reasons why scientists do not want to go above a concentration of gases in the atmosphere that will take us above two degrees, increase in the global average thermostat, uh, the, the global average temperature. Uh, we lock in, they fear, um, a, a, a process which will cause the collapse of the Greenland ice sheet, and we then lose the world economy as we know it, because that's where it sits. Um, along the way, threats to the insurance industry, and herein lies a huge, untapped, as yet, untapped dynamic in the whole thing. Capitalism, as we have it structured at the moment, is dysfunctional to the point of being suicidal because the capital markets are dominated by the insurance industry, the banks, and the pension funds. And right now, these three great um, edifices uh, know to a degree about the climate threat, and yet routinely are required under fiduciary responsibility to shareholders as it is now defined, to invest willy-nilly in the very technologies and industries that are quite literally fueling a threat to their survival. The insurance industry knows this. The underwriting departments of insurance companies are replete with people who now say, whoa, uh, what we're being told by these scientists, we can't tolerate that. We can't price that risk. We are in danger of going bankrupt. Not our company, our 